Please be seated. And we're ready to continue with the testimony. And Ms. Kaplman, you may proceed. All right, so when we broke, we had just listened to call FF. And in FF, Magdiana was indicating that a threatening message was left on the answering machine of the undercover. Was a threatening message left on the answering machine of the undercover? No, it wasn't. All right, I want to go to the next day, April 29th, 2016. Can you tell us what call GG is, please? Can I refer to the call log? You may. GG is, um, it's Charlie Adelson to Catherine McBanwa at 8.45 a.m. If we could publish GG, please. Somebody not from the first layer, but probably the second layer. Yeah, and they just made a big mistake. So don't you worry. Don't worry. Regardless, whatever bullshit is happening, it will be taken care of. For the mere fact that I don't like anybody disrespecting your family, your family, after everything you guys have been through, you know, you told me stuff that happened before, so it's not like I'm a little 
everywhere anyway. Yeah, oh no, it's gonna, it's gonna come, things always come out, and somebody's gonna be fucking someone, they're gonna be running their mouth, that someone will get mad at somebody, and start saying, hey, you know who this was, and then. Okay, there's a few more minutes of that call and a couple other calls, but I think I'm going to read the room and move on to our next issue here. I want to try to clear up some questions surrounding the May 24th interview attempt of Catherine Magbanawa. Did you participate in that? Yes. Okay, and we've heard a little bit about that, but there's some confusion about what occurred with 
this defendant's phone after that interview attempt. Can you explain to the jury what she did with her phone? Did she dump her phone? Did she get a new phone? Did she have a burner phone or something else? No, that's not a leading question. She can ask it in that manner. After the interview attempt, yes. She started turning it on and off and went and got what we call a burner phone. There was a burner phone purchased and she began using that instead of her regular phone for the most part. She still used her regular phone some, but it was turning on and off. All right, and how did turning it on and off affect or impact your ability to monitor her movements or surveil her? Yeah, the GPS tracking on cell phones like that is not actually GPS tracking. It's usually cell tower information and it doesn't give you an exact pinpoint anyways. So when you turn it off, there's no way to actually ping the phone to see what tower it's hitting off of to be able to triangulate the approximate location. And was she still staying at the same location that she had been prior to the interview attempt? No, after the interview attempt, they left that residence and she never returned. All right, so how was it that you were able to locate her for her arrest? I believe it was the following day. We were getting intermittent pings and as I was traveling down there, the TPD tech squad actually got a ping of a shopping center. The following day after what? Oh, sorry, after the interview. She was arrested the following day or you're talking about Garcia's? I'm sorry, the next day we were, I'm sorry, I'm referring to the wrong one. Yes, the following day, I'm sorry, repeat the question. All right, so after the interview attempts, which occurred on May 24th, you said Ms. Magbanawa never returned to the residence she had been living at. How long was she living in some other place unknown to you between the time of the interview attempt and the time of her arrest? Several months. We never found exactly where she was living at after that point. Okay, so she was difficult to track effective the interview attempt. That's correct. Okay, and then I think you were talking about the next day. She was not arrested the next day, right? No, she was not. Okay, do you know when she was arrested? Not until, I believe it was October. All right, and in October, you said you were having a difficult time tracking her. How were you able to locate her to make the arrest? In October? Yes, sir. Yes, when we were, we were getting intermittent pings and one of the pings ended up at a shopping center, a large shopping center with a bunch of businesses. We got in the area of the shopping center, we're riding through it looking for her, and we saw her coming out of a store going through the parking lot to her vehicle. All right, and was there anything unusual about the way law enforcement approached her or the use of force in the making of this particular arrest? No, absolutely not. All right, and you said you were getting intermittent pings. Were those on one or both of the cell phones that she was using at that time? It was, I believe, on one or both. I don't recall exactly. TPD was doing it. All right, and law enforcement was attempting to track both cell phones, the burner phone as well as the phone that she had carried regularly previous. That's correct. Okay. One moment, please. No questions at this time, Judge. Cross-examination? Yes, Your Honor. One quick second to set up here. Sure. No problem. law enforcement, you work for the FBI, right? Correct. 
you would agree with me that your job is to objectively investigate. Correct. Present the good with the bad, right? That's correct. And give that over to the government. Correct. It's culpable and inculpable. Uh, Perfect. You answered it before I asked it. Now, let's talk about FBI, the Department of Justice, <coughs> and reports. Your reports are called 302s, right? Correct. And the purpose of those 302s, and that's the way that I'll refer to it if you're okay? Sure. Is to record your activities, right? For the most part, yes. Now, that's important both internally to the FBI, right? Um, it's more externally for prosecution. They don't want to keep a record of all the investigation that was done in case an agent, um, you know, it dies in the, in the line of duty, passes away, or uh, quits? As long as there's documentation somewhere. Correct. You want to document the action that you're doing, right? Correct. It's also important to you as an agent when you're testifying. You had to refer to some notes. It, it, it helps your memory, right? Correct. You're not just investigating one case at a time over the years. You're working multiple cases at any given time, correct? That's correct. Now, again, you provide that to the prosecution. It's important because, at least on the state level, it gets provided over to the defense, right? Yes, sir. Now, you had said at the beginning of your direct examination yesterday that you investigated the defense's theory, right? Correct. And I want to make sure that we're clear on what happened and what we're saying. I'm showing you it's been entered in the launch pit. It's a little blurry, and now it's better. All right, so now it's, it, it's, it's blurry by design by the, the, the government's version. Y you understand this to be the government's version of the demonstrative, just the removal of the snake animal, right? I'm sorry, repeat that? So I'll let the government have their demonstrative. This is the government's argument right here. Yes. And this is our argument. Okay. Now, direct examination, you said that you investigated the defense's argument right here. Correct, with the information that we had, correct. All right. What did you do to investigate it? Uh, we scrubbed all the phone records through all the intelligence agencies across the, the nation. Um, we scrubbed, I sat down with DEA and ATF, scrubbed all of their phone records, looked at every phone record that um, any, of this, any of the individuals had that um, were associated with them, any investigations that those phone numbers are associated with and identified who those phones were and did everything we could to figure out if there was other phones out there that they could have been talking on. Agent, you would agree with me that sometimes crimes are committed not using phones, correct? Sometimes, yes. All right. Now, in this case, it's weird. At times, there's arguments of burners and there's times that there are arguments of non-burners. Your investigation was limited to the phone numbers that you knew for these participants, right? It was limited to that, plus all the records that we were able to search for other investigations. Correct. Okay, so, and that's what I'm asking. How many 302s did you draft about investigating that theory? I wouldn't do a 302 on not finding anything. You wouldn't do a 302 saying, I investigated this so that somebody else doesn't have to at a later time? No, that would be an investigative analyst that would actually do the scrubbing right. of the numbers, not me. So my understanding of what you did is you looked at Garcia, I'm doing this off memory, his 5986 number? One of his numbers, yes. Okay, and then Charles Abelson, his 9923 number? Yes. And you didn't find anything, so that theory is knocked out? We tried every which way. We tried all the numbers in the past. And I'm not saying you didn't, but what I want to explain to this jury is that the investigation was limited to cell phones. I wouldn't say the investigation was limited to cell phones. Okay, so... I'll ask again, what else did you investigate beyond phones to determine any link in between these individuals? Uh, we, we tried everything. We looked at all bank records. We looked at all credit card statements. We looked at, tried to do surveillance. We tried to see if there was any connection, social media. We tried to do everything to find any links. Did you ever meet with Juan Marcos Vega? No, I did not. Did you ever meet with Anthony Ortiz before he died in July of 2017? No, I didn't. Okay. Let's not talk about Captain yeah. McVeigh. And we're going to sum up here the evidence against her. So the direct evidence is Luis Rivera, correct? He's the only witness that's saying she was involved. Uh, I would disagree with that. 
that saying that Catherine McBanwell was involved, there's another witness saying that? Saying those exact words? No, there's not another witness saying those words, no. Okay, so the only witness that, that's saying that Catherine McBanwell is involved is Luis Rivera. Correct. All right. And essentially what he's telling you, there's three things, that Garcia said she was involved. Garcia told Rivera she's involved, right? Correct. He overheard some phone calls. Correct. And then the morning of the alleged payment, right? Correct. Ultimately, what he tells you is, Katie is the one in the middle doing everything. Correct. Your Honor, may I approach? May. Agent, before we started here today, I'll leave on that. Before we, we started here today during the break, I showed you a video. And you know what that video was, right? Correct. And that is a, a, a short segment of Luis Rivera's statement to you on October 4th, right? Correct. And you know that that's a short statement of his because you're present for it, right? Yes, sir. And that fairly and accurately depicts that little little snippet, right? It does. And you viewed that, but you trust that the snippet is on that CD? I'll take your word for it, yes. All right. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes. Yeah. My apologies, I'm doing this a little bit backwards because it's after the break, so it's not pre marked yet. Objection, Judge. We're publishing something that's not in evidence. I haven't published it yet. Okay, well, right. I can see it. Well, I don't know what that is, but if that's what it is, then it needs to come off. Defense offers has been pre marked as Defense 22. Any objection? Objection, hearsay. It's not introduced to the truth of the matter, Your Honor. It's Louis Rivera saying Katie was in the middle objection, of doing everything. Objection, hearsay, speaking. It's, let, let's go sidebar so I can figure out what this is. Okay, it's marked as what number? 22. Okay, it'll be admitted as defense 22. May I publish? You may. There's also some circumstantial evidence, right? His statements? No, no, no. So we're moving on. We've oh. that's Luis Rivera. That's what he's saying. She's in the middle doing everything. And we talked about the three points that he gives. But there's circumstantial evidence too, right? Yes, there is. There's cash deposits. Yes. Breast surgery. Yes. The car. Yes. Call activity. We're talking about people being in touch with each other. Correct. Paychecks. Yes. Intercepts. Yes. And Dolce Vita. Yes. I hit all the major pieces of evidence, right? I believe so, but I haven't been sitting in court, so I don't know what was presented. Okay. Now, I'm going to assume that you you deny subjectively investigating this case. I deny subjectively? Is deny true? subjectively investigating the circumstantial evidence. I would agree with that. All right. You maintain that you objectively investigated it for guilt or innocence. Yes. Instead of being personally or professionally motivated on building a case against Ms. Magbano. 
That's true. I was not personally motivated. You agree with me, though, that you wanted her to cooperate? I want everyone to cooperate and tell the truth. Right. And we're going to come back to that. Now, let's go to the direct evidence. Rivera, he cooperated, right? Yes. Took the needle out of his arm. I don't know about that. You knew he was charged with first-degree murder? Yes. And you do know from your experience that that could carry the death penalty? It could, yes. His words resulted in Katie's arrest, right? Uh, that and other things, yes. Okay, so September 30th, 2016, Rivera named Katie, right? What was the date again? Uh, September 30th. Yes. The following day she's arrested. Yes. I forget if there's 31 days in September, but 9.30, statement, 10-1, you're in South Florida putting cuffs on her, right? I believe that's correct, yes. Okay. Let's go back and talk about the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Department of Justice, specifically recordings and reports. You'd agree with me that to do recordings on witnesses that are out of custody, it's a, it, you have to get special permission. Correct. And it has to be pertinent, right? Has to be pertinent. Or you tell me, you work there, I don't. Yeah, it, it has, we have to have special permission, yes. All right. In custody is different. If they're in our custody is different, correct. So your testimony is that they have to be in your custody? That's correct. If we arrest somebody under FBI charges, we are required by DOJ policy to record them. Now I'm going to go to some questions and we're going to come back to that. Real quick here. Isn't it true that it's required by the Department of Justice, no matter whose custody they are in, to record? That is not my understanding, no. Would it refresh your recollection to take a look at your deposition? Sure. Council 169 to 170. And then page 20, 10 through 15. Which deposition is uh, first? Okay. And then I'm going to give you another page number when you're done with that. Okay. okay. Then 169 to 170. Referring to the page is correct? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. You said page 169 to 170? Correct. 169 to 170. And take a look at that and let me know if it helps. Both pages. One sixty nine and one seventy. Right. Read both pages. Right. Is it your testimony that? I'm sorry. I'm still reading. Is, oh, I'm asking it, you. Should I read both pages? Please. Yes. Okay. They're short pages. It does. 
Your Honor, if it's okay with the government, so we can just leave that up there. Any objection to that, Ms. Kaplan? No, sir. Okay, right, you can just close it and then we'll reference it as needed. Is your testimony that if somebody is in state custody and an FBI agent goes inside to meet with them, that they are not to record it? That's correct. Okay. That's not law, though, is it? It's just policy. That is, our, that is policy, correct. Now, Tallahassee Police Department, they have a completely different policy, right? Correct. You interviewed several people with Investigator Sherry Bennett? Yes, we did. All out of custody? Um, I don't remember if there was ever anyone. No, no, I'm going to give you the list. Oh, okay. There, there was people that you met with that were out of custody, right? Correct. Jessica Rodriguez? Yes. Junum Chinda? Yes. Samantha Shez Magbanwa? Um, I believe she was in custody. Francis Magbanwa? Yes. Okay. Now, all of those were recorded, correct? I believe so. All right. So just because there is an agent there doesn't mean, hey, it can't be recorded because if there's another department there, they can do whatever their department allows, right? Correct. You'd agree with me that a recording is more accurate. It's word for word. I mean, you can hear the inflection. You know the exact words, correct? Sometimes, depending on the situation, yes. Reports, like the one that you did for Yindra Velasquez, those are, are summarized, right? Correct. You're not giving a full transcript? Correct. You're giving, and I use this word, I, I don't want to convey an improper meaning. You're giving your opinion of what they're saying. Because you're not writing exactly what it is word for word, you're giving what you're interpreting their words to mean, correct? That's a fair, that's a fair statement, yes. Okay. Let's, let's talk about Rivera in his plea agreement. You'd agree with me that he agreed to give the truth and the whole truth, correct? Correct. Now, as a disclaimer here, and I'm going I'm to put it in the form of a question, you understand that I'm not arguing that Luis Rivera was not involved, right? You understand that? I haven't heard your argument yet. Okay. So you understand that, that, that I agree that he was there and he was with Sigfredo Garcia and the two of them killed Professor Markel. Okay. Okay. Now, that goes into the topic that you had on direct examination. And you brought up the fact that he knew certain facts, like that Professor Markel was leaving town and the, the bullet hole in the drug dealer. Do you remember that? Yes. All right. I'll put this in the form of a question. You understand that what I'm saying here is that he is untruthfully implicating others to get a reduction. What's the question? Okay. That Let's you're go to implicating the... that? Correct. It, it, I'm giving you this because it will help with, with, with the questions. Okay. That we're not saying that Rivera and Garcia were not involved. We're saying that he's untruthfully implicating Magbanwa to get a deal. That's okay. your statement you're saying, All right. correct? Correct, yes. Yes, okay. So your testimony, you were saying that certain facts matched up. That would be consistent with the fact that he was actually out there murdering somebody, right? Sure, correct. The leaving town thing could have been learned without Catherine Magbanwa, right? Um, I don't know. If there's direct connection between Sigfredo Garcia and an Adelson, information can flow between an Adelson and Garcia, correct? If there was that contact, then yes. Good. Okay, the bullet hole. Rivera in the car with Garcia, that doesn't involve Ms. McVanwa, correct? Correct. And this drug dealer, who I don't know if he's coming in this week, that has nothing to do with Ms. McVanwa, right? No, it doesn't. All right. So you're also aware of Luis Rivera's inconsistencies in his testimony, correct? Um, a couple of them. All right, so let's go over those. You're aware that there's an inconsistency of when he found out it was a murder. Object to improper impeachment. If you know, you can answer that. I don't know. I don't know of that. I don't believe. So correct me if I'm wrong. Louis Rivera on 10-4, what he tells you is that he learns before the car is even rented, before they've left Miami. Okay. You're saying okay is it? As I, I if, if you're agreeing that. with what I said. Is that not what he said? I wasn't there. You were. I vaguely remember that, but I don't remember the exact date when he said that. All right. There was an inconsistency, and you were there when he gave the statement as to who drove on one of the trips, where he said he didn't drive, but he got a citation, right? Objection. Improper impeachment. May we approach, Your Honor? No, no. This is not impeachment at this point. No, I'll, I'll allow the question. Go ahead, if you can answer that. Yes. No, he did not say that he did not drive at all. He actually said that... Um, I think they went back and forth driving. He was a little confused about who was driving exactly which point, but I believe he said that you know he was a little mistaken about the timing of it because he was mistaken about when he even got the ticket. He said that about the. 
He said that about the trip that he got the citation on. He said he got the citation on the wrong okay. trip. And our records show it was different. Let's go to the next one. How many trips did he tell you were made to Tallahassee for this murder? Objection, Two. hearsay, or improper impeachment? That's hearsay. Your Honor, I'm now impeaching Mr. Rivera, who has already testified. Mr. Rivera has given a statement to this witness. Improper impeachment, Your Honor. May we approach? We can approach, Your Honor. Agent, I'm going to ask you again. You, or let's just preface it for the, the jury here. You met with Luis Rivera 5-27-2016? I believe that was the date. 5-27? Let's go with the end of May 2016. Okay. Beginning of June 2016. You're talking about the jail interviews, yes. Yes. The end of September 2016? Correct. And then again, early October 2016? Correct. How many trips did Luis Rivera tell you were made? to Tallahassee for the purpose of this murder. By who? By him? By anybody involved. I believe he told us too. Through your investigation, this in includes the, uh, the, the statements that were obtained from Luis Rivera, your review of the call detail records. Where was he the morning after the murder when the phone call started going? You're asking for the cell phone records, where that was or where he said he was? I can't recall. Both. I recall him saying that he was at the barber shop. And? I don't recall the cell phone record. That's Sergeant Corbett question. And you remember writing a 302 about the cell phone communication that, that morning? I do. And you would agree with me that you wrote down that he was at a different location on Normandy Island? I don't recall. I'd have to look at that and refresh my memory. Which day am I looking at? Uh, July 19th, the morning after. Okay. Uh, 
Yes, sir. Uh, do you need me to ask a question again? Yes, sir. All right. Where did your investigation of the data show that Luis Rivera was that morning? Um, the investigation showed that his phone, from my report, I saw that his phone was in the area of 79th and Byron Avenue at 1020 a.m., but I don't believe there was any other locations that morning of okay. where his phone was. Now, for the jury, Byron Avenue, that's on Normandy Isle, right? Um, I believe so, it was out close, to the, close to the beach. I believe that's where it is, from my and memory. That's, that's a wholly different location than where Jessica Rodriguez lives and that barber shop is at, right? I believe it's across the bridge, yes, right across the water. And that's when the communications start, right? Communications with Mr. Rivera? So, and if it's okay with the government to give a disclaimer, that morning of 719, and your report I think explains it too, the report that Mr. Rivera would have, there's a volley of communications between Catherine McVano trying to find Sigfredo Garcia, then Anthony Ortiz enters the mix, then Luis Rivera and Ms. McVano communicate, right? There's a flurry of phone calls and then Luis Rivera explains, oh, this is the money of the, this is the morning of the alleged payment, right? So I cannot say that those were the people speaking, those were, those were their phones that were communicating. Okay, and you've always operated under the belief that Luis Rivera had that 8153 number, that handset with him that morning, right? Yes. Because that's the phone number that's communicating with Ms. McVanwa, communicating with Jessica Rodriguez, right? Correct. And that, that was something that he built his testimony around, the, the fact that he said, I spoke to Catherine, then I spoke to Jessica, and I went back to the house, right? I don't know what he testified to today. Or this week? I'm talking about the statements that you've received, not the testimony okay. in this trial. Okay. In fairness to the jury, you're not allowed to watch that. Correct. Okay. So, who called who that morning? Who called who first? Did Catherine call Luis Rivera, or did Luis Rivera call Ms. McVano? I don't have the complete phone records. What I did on my 302 was take what I thought was pertinent out of the phone records, because there's a lot of phone records, right. and that's what I put in my 302. So I can't, that would be a Sergeant Corbett. Corbett question because he was the expert. This was something for my reference to be able to go back to and remember if I needed to. So what you're saying is that there was a communication between Lewis Rivera and Kath McVanwa that morning, but the report that Mr. Rivera has did not say who called who. I don't know. Does it say it in there? Does it say what again? Say that again. Does it say who called who? It says Rivera called Nagbanwa at 1020. Yes. Okay. You know from your previous interviews from him that what Rivera said was that Catherine called him, right? Catherine call, called him and said, hey, I got the money, right? I don't recall that off the top of my head, but it's possible. If he did, that would be an inconsistency, correct? And that's what we're talking about here, his inconsistencies. It could be. All right. Now, in, in your interview of him on September 30th and October 4th, he, he also tries to give information against Wendy Adelson, correct? Correct. Where he says that the day before the murder, that they're driving by the house, that they see this woman with two little boys. He asks Garcia, and Garcia says, that's her, that's Wendy. And that Rivera then presses him, and he goes, that's Wendy. And then the woman actually walks into the same house where they commit the murder the next day, right? I don't remember if he said he saw them going in the house, but yes, the rest of that was correct. Through your investigation, you found that it was impossible that she could have been in the, at the house that day with the boys because the boys were in daycare, correct? I didn't find that, but the team found that, yes. Your Honor, we do have a stipulation. If the court would be willing to read it, um, it has been reviewed with the government. All right. Do you want to see it again? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor, I have reviewed it. Okay. Second word then. Please. Okay. All right, this is a stipulation. I'll read you the instruction in regards to stipulations first. When parties agree that certain facts are true, 
That is called a stipulation of fact. You must accept stipulated facts as having been proven. However, the significance of these facts, as with all facts, is for you to decide. In this case, the stipulated fact that you must accept as true is the Markell children were enrolled at Creative Preschool, which is in Tallahassee, Florida. The drop-off pickup schedule for the week of the murder is as follows. Monday, July 14, 2014, dropped off by, at 8.55 a.m. by Dan Markell, picked up at 5 p.m. by Dan Markell. Tuesday, July 15, 2014, Dropped off at 8.25 a.m. by Dan Markell. Picked up at 4.50 p.m. by Dan Markell. Wednesday, July 16, 2014. Dropped off at 9 a.m. by Dan Markell. Picked up at 4.30 p.m. by Wendy Adelson. Thursday, July 17, 2014. Dropped off at 8.30 a.m. by Wendy Adelson picked up at 4.45 p.m. by Dan Markell. Friday, July 18, 2014, dropped off at 8.50 a.m. by Dan Markell. Thank you, Your Honor. Agent, that would be another inconsistency of Mr. Rivera, correct? Uh, it would be on what he was told, correct. Huh. Or <coughs> what he told you. It could be, possible. Let's, let's go back to FBI, DOJ, and the work that you do. And you said that, you know, the hope is cooperation. You would agree with me that on the federal level, many times the goal is, on these bigger federal cases, to get people to cooperate against each other. I uh, find that in all cases, not just but, federal cases. But you find it that that's, that's, that's usually a drive to get the dominoes to fall, right? If we don't have evidence on other people, then that is one technique that you can, you can use. And you would agree with me that on the federal level, to get your 5K, your Rule 35, which are the legal terms for reductions, many times you, you have to actually lead to an indictment that leads to a conviction. In some cases. And you, you understand that Luis Rivera had just come from the feds, right? He, was, he had just been federally prosecuted? Yes, he was in the federal system. Where he had gotten cooperated against? I don't know if he got cooperated against or not. All right, so he had just come from that system that, that talks about getting other convictions for reductions. Now he's involved in this case, and you're involved, right? Correct. And he knows you're involved. Correct. And he knows from your lapel pin and the badge probably on your hip that you work for the FBI and the credentials that you showed him. Correct. So he knows, again, that the feds are involved. Yes. All right, let's go now to 5-27-2016. That's the, the first time you meet with Louis Rivera, right? Yes. You interviewed him in custody. Correct. You recorded it and you did a report. Yes. June 21st, 2016, you interview him again. Correct. He's in custody. Yes. You recorded it again. Correct. Sometime in August or September, he comes to an agreement with that office, right? I don't know when they came to an agreement. But you do know that on September 30th, 2016, you interviewed him again. That's correct. He was in custody, in state custody. Correct. It was not recorded. Correct. Could have been. Could have been. You were notified on September 29, 2016, so it wasn't you know, a last minute thing. You could have gotten the gear. Um, correct. Retired investigator Isom actually had a camera with him that was used in the van ride right after, right? No, I believe that was incorrect. All right. I believe that was somebody else's camera that he borrowed when we went on the van ride. But what I'm saying is he had it. No, he didn't have it with him. He borrowed it okay. when we went on the van ride. Now, you were in the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office, right? That's correct. You were in the same interview room where on October 4th it was recorded, right? That's correct. So that room could have recorded it. It could have. You would agree with me that on the September 30th interview, you did not write a report either? No, I did not. That was a proffer. So, Agent... Is that non breaking policy? No recording, no report? No, it's not. Not for a proffer. And again, I'm, I'm just going to ask you one more time. If they're in state custody, your testimony is that you don't have to record it. That's correct. Counsel, pages 169 to 170. 
19 to 25, 1 to 7. Agent, you remember some years back, 2019, in the courthouse here in room 311, we took your deposition? Yes. It was myself, Ms. Kawas, I think Ms. Gottman was there, there was a court reporter. That was the second time or? First time. Very first time, okay. Second time's a short one. Okay. Do you remember being asked the following questions and giving the following answers? Questions, so you will not record? Answer, unless it's special permissions or it's DOJ policy when they're in custody, we have to record. Question, if it's an inmate, you. If it's an inmate, if they're in our custody, if we arrest somebody and we're going to interview them, DOJ policy is now, it's a newer policy, just a cut few years ago. Question, Varela was recorded by you. Answer, the, yeah, he was in the, he was in the jail, yeah. Question by me, but not your custody. Answer, it's both. It's in custody. In our, in our custody or in custody jail. Doesn't yes. that mean any jail? And I was mistaken at the time, and I believe when we made those recordings, the policy wasn't even in place yet. But you didn't say that when you were asked the questions in 2019. No, you didn't ask specifically, but no, I was confused about exactly which recording and I've gone back and reviewed the policy since then. When I asked the question to you, Varela was recorded, and this is uh, George Varela, AKA Shooty, right? Correct. And he was in state custody. Yes. And, he, and you said, and I said he was recorded and your answer was he was in the jail. And I said, but not your custody. And your answer was it's both. It's in custody in our custody or in custody jail. And I was confused at that time because I actually interviewed him the first time and did not record him. And I went back the second time when um, the state attorney's office asked me to record him the second time. Agent, but what you said in 2019 when asked this question is that it's DOJ policy to record, correct? And I just said I was mistaken when I told you I understand that. that. But, okay. but, what, but what you told us before under oath was it's DOJ policy, right? Yes, and I was mistaken. There wasn't a jury when you were going to ask those questions before, right? No. Okay. It was just us talking, right? Yes. About a lot of things. All right. And thereafter, you never updated Ms. Kappelman to update us that you were incorrect in your deposition and that you were wrong on the policy, correct? I forgot that I had that one little uh, statement there. Yes. Is it your testimony that, so with, with George Emanuel Varela, AKA Shooty, you met with him on May 31st, 2016? I don't remember the date. In June 29, 2016? That's the two dates that you have in my reports. And is it your testimony that you didn't report both of them? That's correct. Well, let me ask this in a different way. Were they both not recorded? No, I believe the second one was recorded. The first one was just a 302, I believe. All right, so agent. If I have a Hawk, what's a Hawk video? A uh, Hawk video is a type of recorder, okay. type of software. Used by the feds? Yes. And if I have a Hawk video from May 31st, 2016 and June 29, 2016 for George Emanuel Varela, does that not mean that the feds recorded it? You're telling me you have two recordings for him? I am. I don't recall that. If that's true, doesn't that just impeach what you've just said? about the fact that the state told you to go back and record it again? No, it's not true, no. But at the end of the day, you nonetheless broke policy by not writing a report about your interview of the key witness in this case, Louis Rivera. Like I said a while ago, it was a proffer. We don't record proffers, we don't write reports on it unless it's requested to by the, by the prosecutors. So you're telling me that, that it was these prosecutors that said, don't write down what he says? No, that's not what, that's not what I said. They're not your boss, are they? No. You're above them. You're the FBI. You work for the Department of Justice. I do, and it's a joint case. Yes, but, but you do not take orders from a local prosecutor's office, do you? No, Objection, but I'll... argumentative. All right, you can answer the question. I wouldn't do that with a federal prosecutor either. 
their policy does not supersede FBI and DOJ, right? Right, and that was not our policy to record proffers. All right. So let's get to the conclusion on this topic. The only inmate interview in this case that was not recorded by either TPD or yourself, the only one is Rivera, correct? No, I'd like to see the recording of uh, Varela, if you have it. Sure. <clears throat> For Gardner. But we'll come back to that when they pull it up. Other than those discs that we're getting right now, and to ask for the jury again, of all of the inmates that were met with in this case, and there's a whole bunch of them, right? Not that I interviewed, no. There's only a handful that I interviewed. The handful that you interviewed, out of all of them, Luis Rivera being in custody when you met with him, him and We'll get the answer right now for Varela. Okay. You know of no other inmates that were not recorded, correct? Not off the top of my head, no. You would agree with me that Mr. Rivera is more important than any other witness in this case? He turned out to be, yes. When you met with him on September 30th, that was the first time that he was giving you his information on the case? Correct. We have no way to bring that information and show it in front of the jury to show any more of those inconsistencies in his testimony, do we? Outside of our testimony, no. We have to take your word based on your memory, right? Because there's no report either. Correct. I believe Investigator Isom did a report. I understand. You'd agree with me, though, that if we had a recording, it would be a more accurate reflection of the exact words that he said. And that would be the case with anything, yes. All right. Let's talk more about Luis Rivera, specifically on the murder trip. Now, for reference here, because of the mention of the third trip, I'm going to refer to the June trip and the murder trip, okay? Okay. Because I don't know when the third was, if it was before or after. So on the murder trip, you did an investigation into the hotels in the area, correct? Um, you say I, it was the team of... Uh, yeah, you guys were working did. as a team. The team did, yeah. And that investigation involved going to all the local hotels and pulling all their registration cards, all their databases to find out if these guys stayed anywhere, right? At this point, you already had the names of the people, right? No, I believe they started early on with the hotels and they went back and did it again after we got the names. Now, for this murder trip, you were able to, and, and when I say you, you were saying it was a joint effort, so I'll just say the, the team, you were able to uncover a registration card that tied back to Luis Rivera, correct? Correct. I believe so. I didn't collect it, but I saw it. I think it's collected. Defense offers with the free mark is, is defense 23. Is the business record certification attached? No objection, Your Honor. Be admitted as defense 23. Permission to publish? You may. All right. So, Adrian, what, what we have here is a registration card for the budget in, correct? Correct. It's got Luis Rivera. Correct. Norm the aisle address? Correct. He puts on there that there's, there's two people, right? Yes. All right. Now, again, I don't disagree with you. Sigfredo Garcia is there. All right. But now I want to reference to you the, the June trip. You don't have any hotel paperwork for the June trip, correct? I don't believe so. All right. So there's nothing that's establishing that Luis Rivera wasn't alone on that June trip, right? With respect, let, let me rephrase that. Okay. There are no documents from any hotels like this. Like, this shows number of people in the party, too, right? Correct. There's no documentation like that supporting Garcia being there for the June trip, right? No hotel documentation, correct. Correct. I'm not saying that there are other things that's been discussed, but we're just focusing on, on this paperwork. Okay. All right. Now let's talk about Anthony Ortiz. Thank 
has better questions than me. So it, it, did Luis Rivera not say that he stayed at that same budget in on the first trip? I believe he did, yes. All right, but somehow no records were able to be retrieved. No, we had to, uh, from my understanding, I believe Investigator Isom had to dig through basically an attic to, just to find that one, something like an attic to find that paper document. It was not very well organized hotel. I'm sure he loved that. Yes. So let's talk about Anthony Ortiz. You understand Anthony Ortiz to be known as King Anthony. That's what I've heard, yes. And what that means is that he was a Latin King member like Luis Rivera. Correct. You'd agree with me that he didn't say in either the 930 statement to you, the one that was unrecorded and not recorded, or the October 4th statement, he never mentioned. Objection, improper impeachment, Your Honor. Um, establishing a negative, Your Honor. It's not impeachment. Well, let's finish the question. What's the question? He never mentioned King Anthony's involvement. I'll allow it. Uh, not that I recall. He, he never mentioned King Anthony's uh, involvement in the alleged payment on the morning of July 19th. I don't recall him doing that, no. Never said anything about giving King Anthony his phone to go to Normandy Eye, stuff like that? No. And of course, now we talked about a third trip, but specifically now to King Anthony. Garcia never, uh, I'm sorry, Rivera never told you about a trip between Garcia and King Anthony to Tallahassee, right? No. Never mentioned any involvement whatsoever? Not that I recall in, our, in those meetings, no. And for that reason, because it was never mentioned, you never investigated King Anthony? Correct. And, and we touched on this before, but to give the exact date, you're aware that he died July 9, 2017? I was not aware of the date, but I would heard that he passed away, yes. If he died July 9, 2017, or do you not remember when he died, or do you not know? I just don't remember. Your Honor, if I could have one brief moment. I think you said you didn't remember the date, correct? Uh, yes, sir. He said he didn't remember the date. We refresh your recollection to take a, a, a look at the obituary posting? Probably not. So I think somebody else saw that, not me. If he did die on that day, well, he did die. But it, if his death happened specifically on July 9, 2017, you would agree with me that that was 12, 13 months after Luis Rivera has already cooperated. I'd agree with that. All right. So had he mentioned him at all and given full and truthful testimony like he has to give with a cooperation agreement, the FBI can move fast on that and figure things out, right? Possibly, yes. All right. And through that, there could have been that possible connection between Garcia and one of the Adelsons. I don't know about that connection. Because he's dead and you never met with him. I never saw any evidence to, to even allude to that. If Rivera had said to you, though, this guy was involved, you would have met with him, right? Yes. Okay. Now, Rivera never made any statements to you that on the morning of July 19th, everybody had burner phones, did he? No, I don't believe so. We touched on that a moment ago. You've always operated under the premise that Luis Rivera had his 8153 number, right? Correct. And Rivera and all of your other investigation only showed that Ms. McBanwa had a 1312 number. Correct. Let's talk about Juan Marcos Vega. You've heard that name, right? I've heard it. And you know from the federal indictment that it's a co-defendant of Luis Rivera. Yes. He was a Latin King probationer. Okay. I didn't, wasn't familiar with him being a probationer, but okay. All right. Have you taken a look at Mr. Rivera's indictment? Uh, it's been years. Would it refresh your recollection and take a look at the indictment? Uh, refresh my recollection of what, exactly? What his status was in the Latin Kings. You've, re you've reviewed indictments before, right? Yes. You know that in all federal indictments that there's a factual section that explains who parties are, who businesses are, stuff like that, right? Yes. You read that before? Yes. If Juan Marcos Vega is a co-defendant, which you know him to be, there would be a description of his involvement in this RICO indictment within the indictment, right? Sure. I'm not contesting that he's not a probationer. Right. I just don't remember. Do you trust me that he was a probationer of the Latin sure. Kings? Sure. All right. Did investigate uh, Jason Newland, he's an investigator with uh, Ms. Kaplan, right? Correct. So he's law enforcement but works for them? Correct. Did you receive any information from investigator Newland about Juan Marcos Vega? Not that I recall. 
would that be why the FBI yourself did not investigate Juan Marcos Vega? I uh, didn't, didn't investigate him because I found no other evidence of him linking, being linked to any investigation. Well, you didn't get the evidence because Jason Newland didn't tell you, right? If he had evidence, yes. Okay. And if he had, if he had evidence and he gave that to you and said, hey, look, there, there's a lead here. We need to do something. You would have done something about that, right? If it hadn't already been followed up on by them or if there was something valuable there, then yes. You would agree with me that, and, and you said it on direct examination, your role in coming into this was to be the arms outside of Leon County, right? For the most part, yes. It's not that they can't do it, but yes, I have a better mechanism to be able to make that happen. Yeah. So their jurisdiction is local, whereas yours is, it's national, actually, but yours is throughout, the, you, you have an easy reach throughout the state. I do because I have agents in other locations I can reach out to. But, but you, but you actually have sort of like a, you know, a, a cop here can't go to another, an, another county and arrest somebody, right? That's correct. But you can't. Correct. Because you have national jurisdiction. Correct. Right? So your understanding of Juan Marcos Vega is that he's indicted down in South Florida, right? Correct. And that he's located in a federal facility outside of Leon County. Yes. We're jumping topic to topic, we're moving quick. Let's go to the bump now. You would agree with me that it's not inexpensive. What's not inexpensive? Cost money, right? What is? All right, let, let, let's break it down here. So the bump, Donna Adelson, she's handed the, the paperwork from the undercover, right? Yes. All right, there's a lot of agents that are involved, right? There were. They're paid by taxpayer money. Correct. There's a lot of Miami Beach Police Department that are involved. Uh, I disagree with that. There was a couple of people that are task force members. You didn't have a briefing at MB, uh, Miami Beach Police Department headquarters in Washington Ave before the bump? We used their facility, yes. All right. So what we're talking about here is it wasn't just a few people doing a quick bump. It was a big operation. And I'm not saying that Correct. it was improper, but you have a lot of this for safety, right? Correct. All right. You also had a high altitude plane. It was a, yes, it's a, it's a Miami division plane, yes. That ain't cheap, is it? I don't know the cost of it, but they have it. Right. Yes. This, this is a plane literally just flying in a circle, filming what's on the ground. Yeah, a single engine plane, yes. All right, people look like ants running around, right? Yes. Understanding it's for safety, but there, there's a lot that goes into it, right? Correct. Now, there was a letter that was handed by the undercover to Don. You know I'm going to this question, right? Yes, sir. Right. This is the best copy, and I'm showing state agency. This is the best copy we have, right? Yes, sir. Nobody thought to make a copy or take a photo of the actual paperwork that was given to Don Adelson. We thought about it, and the problem was the amount was being disputed between TPD and us on scene, and couldn't decide on the amount, and next thing we know, it was time to run out the door and get out there and get in place. So the undercover wrote the number on there real quick and took it with him out the door. I was worried about everything else during the briefing, and I should have taken a photo of it. I forgot. Agent, before you could answer that question, I took a photo of that on my phone. Before you could even, you'd agree with me, it can be done quickly. Sure, right? absolutely, and I forgot. Your words are, it slipped our minds. Yes. You agree that, that, that you should have copied. Correct, yes. And you, as, as the lead agent, you cannot say that the document that was actually handed did not have additional things put onto it. I can very, uh, very strongly say that that is, that is accurate. There was nothing else written on there because Oscar, the undercover, was only doing what I told him to do, and that was it. All right. But you didn't see it before it was handed over? No, I saw it when he walked out the door with it. All right. No report detailed exactly what was on it, right? Um, I believe there is a report saying the amount and the, the phone number is on there. Okay. But at the end of the day, we don't have an actual copy of it. Right. Let's go to our next topic. Talk about Instagram. Louis Rivera in his statements to you, he talks about a time when he posted a photo on Facebook or Instagram, right? Correct. And how somehow Katie then orders the boss of the Latin Kings to take it down and he takes it down, right? Correct. All right. Now before we jump into it, and I want to make sure that I get this clear. He tells you it was an owl, right? He did. Not a lion. No, I believe it was an owl. Yeah. 
definitely not a lion. There's a big difference in between an owl and a lion, right? Yes. You'd agree with me? Yes. All right. Now I'm showing you what's been added to the fence and not. You recognize the guy in that little circle, right? Um, it appears to be Mr. Rivera. Okay, so this is this is Mr. Rivera's Instagram page, right? Now, in this case, uh, to make sure that it's uh, the chance that, that somebody doesn't know, your understanding is that Facebook owns Instagram, right? That's my understanding. All right, so when you want to get records from either Facebook or Instagram, you send a subpoena out to Facebook for either Facebook or Instagram, they send it back to you, right? It depends on what kind of records they are. Sometimes it's a search warrant that's required. All right, but you would send it to Facebook, right? Correct. And in this case, subpoenas or warrants were sent to Facebook for Ms. McBannon, right? Yes. For Sigfredo Garcia. Yes. Did anybody ever get this, this guy's records? I'm not sure. I didn't send those search warrants to any of the, the social media. I'm not sure. Have you, ever, have you ever seen any response to any subpoenas or warrants sent to Facebook for Luis Rivera's Instagram records? I haven't seen any, but I haven't seen all the documentation from T TPD on their court orders and stuff either. Now, of course, Luis Rivera says he mm -hmm. took the photo down, but you don't know how the data works at Facebook and Instagram as to pictures that are removed and if that information is retained, correct? You don't know that? No, I don't. All right. The only way that we would, you know, know if that's the case is if we were to get his records, right? That's correct. All right. Now, it's different with respect to a search warrant. They get search warrants, not us, right? Correct. Is the reason why this was never requested out of a fear that the deeper we dig into Luis Rivera, the greater the chance that we find more inconsistencies in what he's telling us? Absolutely not. My understanding was that they did dig into it, but I never saw it. You would agree with me that it would be, it would have been smart to get his Instagram records after that claim. If it was available, yes. You don't know whether it was available or not? I personally do not. And he gave his statement less than two years after the murder? That sounds right. You're not aware of the retention period of Facebook? I don't. You not have no of Instagram. You have no reason to believe that it's less than two years. Uh, for Instagram, I'm not sure about that. I know Facebook is not, but Instagram's a little different. Okay, but we'll never know. I don't know. You can check with the uh, TPD officers. All right, let's go through circumstantial evidence now. Let's start, and we'll go in order of what we talked about before. Okay. If your honor wants me to stop at a point for no, an you can continue break. for uh, for just uh, about 15 more minutes. Cool. All right. Yeah, I can do that. So, circumstantial evidence. We'll start out with the, the cash deposits. The theory here is that it's, it's payment from a murder, right? Uh, that's what the evidence uh, led us to believe, yes. Okay, and that's good for your theory, it's, right? It's evidence. It's, it's evidence for your theory. We'll phrase it that way. Okay. All right. You agree with me that you sitting here as the lead agent on it, you cannot say where that money came from. No, we tried to find where it came from. We looked at all possible avenues to try to figure out where it came from. All right. So let's talk about the evidence that we do have. And this is going to focus on nightclubs, okay? Okay. In 2013, you're aware that Ms. McBanwa was working in nightclubs, right? Yes. Actually, we're going to back up here. That in 2013, she was doing liquor promotions. Okay, yes, I believe that sounds right. Agent, I'm showing you it's been pre marked. It's the bench 24. You know what that is, right? I've seen it before. All right. You know that that's a, that's a photo from Ms. McBannell's Facebook account, right? Yes, I believe so. And you know that from your investigation in the case? 
Correct. And that is in the same or substantially the same condition it was in when we first saw it. It appears to be. Defense offers a free mark defense 24. No objection, Your Honor. Be admitted as defense 24. Now, Agent, what, what did you say about Facebook and the record retention? What would you believe on here? I believe Facebook kept, a, kept things longer than Instagram, but I don't really know about Instagram. And Facebook owns Instagram. There is some belief. I, I don't know exactly when and all that. I'm not sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Cut you off. I, I'm not sure. Permission to publish, Your Honor? Yes. So, Agent, sometime, Ms. McVann was arrested in 2016, right? Yes. And you're able to get a photo that had been uploaded in 2013? I don't know when they obtained this record. I'm not sure. Would you agree with me? And we're not talking about the time frame that she did it, but you would agree with me that this is evidence that Ms. McVann was working liquor promotions? Yes. And she's obviously not, you know, going back in time and posting in 2013. You believe that it's 2000, you believe that the post is contemporaneous with when the, the picture's taken? Uh, you're referring to the date at the bottom, says 2013? Correct. Correct. All right. Let's go forward now to 2014. There's no question that she's working in nightclubs, right? Uh, we had indications that she was, yes. But your words are, there was no question that she was working in clubs. Those are my words. Would it refresh your recollection, take a look at your deposition? No, if you, if you say it's in there, then I'll trust you, but... It's in there. Okay. All right. No question she's working, no question she would be getting cash tips, right? Sure. You're sure to my question, or sure she would be, I want to make sure that it's clear for the jury. You, as, as an FBI agent, with your, your professional and lay knowledge, it is no stretch of the imagination in 2014 that she's receiving cash tips if she's working in these nightclubs. Yes, it's very possible. 2015, it's your understanding she, as well, is working in nightclubs. There was a check that was in 2015. I don't recall any other evidence that proves she was in, working in nightclubs in 2015. I don't recall. Now, the check that you're talking about, and we'll come to that, you're talking about Club Fate, right? I believe so. Now, you have also, you, you've seen that check, and that's 2015, right? Correct. And you've also spoken to Ramsey Neighbor. Yes. And what Mr. And you spoke to Yinger Mascaro, right? Correct. And what Ms. Mascaro tells you is that Ms. McVannell worked at Fate in 2014. Correct. And then you also have the checks from 2015. That's correct. Ramsey Neighbor did not have a great memory, did he? Uh, depends on what you describe as a great memory. Remembering things. I mean, he remembered her. That was pretty good. Remembered her, but he did not remember exact. He did not remember exact details about all the employees. It took him a while to remember. He didn't have any records and stuff like that, right? That's correct. Okay. And you don't know whether Ms. McBanwell worked there in 2014, left, and came back in 2015, which would be consistent with Ms. Mascaro on the check, right? The only information we have was that one check that we but could find. Ms. Mascaro specifically remembered that she worked there before she became pregnant, right? Correct. I believe that's what she told us. And there's no question that Ms. Mascaro had her child in 2014. Or that she became pregnant in July 2014 and nine months later had her child. I believe so. Right? And, and, and we don't believe that Ms. Mascaro, as a young mother, is working at a nightclub all night, right? As a young mother? Yes. I don't know about that either. Okay. But the information that you do have is Ms. Mascaro, that Ms. McBann was working there in 2014, and from the check, 2015, right? That's the information we had. The phrase consistent with has been thrown out a lot in this trial. Is that not consistent with Ms. McBannell working at Club Fate at two different times? At two different times, yes. I'm showing you it's been entered as defense 18. You've seen this before, right? I have. Photograph of 2015. I don't know when the photograph was taken, no. You got a velvet rope in the background? Yes. And you've gone and tried to investigate these nightclubs? Yes. All right. as if you read my mind. Do I May. Agent, I'm showing you it's been pre-marked defense 25. You know what that is, right? 
Uh, it appears to be the check that we were just referring to. All right. And you know if that's the check that we're referring to because you've seen it before, you investigated this case, and you're the Ms. McBanley's financial record? I didn't see it in the financial records. I saw it at a previous hearing. All right. And that is in the same or substantially the same condition it was in last time you saw it? I believe so. Defense offered with the three mark as Defense 25. Any no objection? objection, Your Honor. Be admitted as Defense 25. Publish, Your Honor? Yes. All right, agent. This is the check that you're talking about? Correct. And, all right, so what we've got here is up top, club fate? Yes. Time frame, June 8, 2015? Correct. Now, that's the next summer after when Ms. Mascara tells you that they're working at club fate, right? Correct. Made up to Ms. Magdalene once? Yes. Now, this 401 to 516, do you know, if you know, is that tips that she's getting from credit card transactions? Are those cash tips that she was supposed to receive? Do you have any knowledge? I don't. All right. Do you know whether this, this check cashed or not? I was told that it bounced. All right. And if it bounced, are you aware that your neighbor instead gave her cash because he felt bad that the, the check had bounced? No. I was never told that. And again, Mr. Neighbor, all his records were ruined, right? Correct. Let's talk briefly about the iCloud data in this case. You you objectively reviewed, right? Correct. And you went through all of Charles Adelson's iMessages, right? I can't say I went through all of them. I went through some of them. Are you aware of the message on April 30th, 2015, where Ms. McBann was talking about quitting the nightclubs because she's getting Objection, home? Objection, hearsay. Overruled. Because I, she's, do you remember? I don't recall off the top of my head if I saw that one or not. Would it refresh your recollection to take a look at the iMessage? Sure. May I Yes. Okay. I'd not do. And Your Honor, I'll get through this topic and then I'll advise the court. That okay. okay. If I could approach. Yes. Did that help your memory? Yes, it did. All right, 2015, Ms. McMahon will work at nightclubs. She makes the statement to Charlie that she is. And that's specifically that she's working a night job and she wants to let go of it because it's just too taxing to be working all night and coming home to her kids? Objection, hearsay. Um, I'll allow, you can answer if you can. That's the statement she made to Mr. Adelson, yes. Now, in direct examination, there, there was a lot of talk about the, the intercepts in this case. And you listened to all of those intercepts, correct? Not all of the intercepts, no. I was in Miami a lot and out elsewhere we had other officers monitoring, things like that. All right. Are you aware of the phone call between Ms. Magbanwa and Susanna Garcia? Susanna Garcia is Sigfredo Garcia's mother, correct? That's correct. We're in April 23rd. She's talking about Objection. working. Objection. Uh, Here's your That's honor. sustained. So, Agent, what I'm asking you here is the evidence that you're able to deduce. So, we'll back up. You believe to be the cash deposit, circumstantial evidence of Ms. McVanwa's guilt, right? Correct. And we're asking about what investigation you did to objectively investigate the source of that money, right? Correct. And what we have is that there, the, the response is that there's limited evidence that she was working at those clubs, right? Correct. So, what I'm asking you now is, are there any phone calls where Ms. McBann was talking about working in those clubs as part of the intercepts that this government has? Objection, hearsay, calls for hearsay. Uh, you, can, you can answer that question. I don't recall any of those calls, no. You don't recall the phone call on April 23rd, 2016? Not off the top of my head, no. Okay. Let's go now to the, the investigation of what you did for these, these nightclubs. 
there's some intercepts that you haven't listened to. That's what you just said, right? Sure. All right. Again, you were brought in for the investigation outside of Leon County. Initially, yes. And you made many trips to South Florida in this case, right? Yes. With hopes of finding evidence to build the case against Ms. McBann or to force her to cooperate, right? That's incorrect. So you get brought on two days after the murder, right? Uh, maybe three. All right. You're already sending out emails looking for Priuses as early as July of 2014, are you not? Yes. It was maybe three days after, like the 21st, I believe. Okay. So I misunderstood. But we agree that you're on it from the beginning. Yes. And over the years, 2014, 15, 16, 17, up until this year, you're making trips to South Florida. Correct. And when was the first time that you did any investigation into Club Fate or Hollywood Live? I don't remember the exact date when we went down, we learned about them and learned that they were going to be, that that was her justification for having money. That's when we went back and tried to follow up on them. Okay, so let's go through the chronology here. 2019, during okay. the fall, you're on that stand and I'm asking you questions, right? Okay. You're questioned by me, right? Correct. About never investigating the nightclubs. Yes. Then, literally, the day that the pandemic hits Florida, you're in South Florida with Jason Newman, right? That's correct. You were down there to meet with some witnesses. Correct. And you went to Club Fate and knocked on the door. Yes. During the day. Yes. To a nightclub. Yes. And nobody was there. Correct. And you were able to get on the phone with Ramsey Neighbor and have a conversation with him. Correct. Get some details. Yes. You then went over to Hollywood Live. Yes, I believe that. That might um, not be the exact order. Yeah. That's okay. Where was I? I don't know. <laughs> Where were you was the question. Where were Hollywood you? Live. <laughs> Where were you? So you then go over to Hollywood Live, right? I don't remember if it was the order, that exact order, but yes, we went to both. You speak to a guy. Yes. No idea what his name is. No. No idea who the owner is now. No. The owner may be in jail, something like that. Could be, yes. And you get no information. Correct. 2021, you, you speak to Ramsey Neighbor again, right? Yes. Again, over the phone. Correct. Never met with him in person. No. Haven't spoken to any of his coworkers. No. No subpoenas for any records. Um, I don't recall. I thought we had a subpoena for the records, but I don't recall. You would agree with me that this is not the level of investigation that you have done on other facts in this case, right? That's true because the avenues to take to get to this information is totally different than other avenues because whether I find where somebody says that there were no records, so anybody's word about what she made, nobody had records of it. If there was absolute records, then yes, I would, I would go through the extent of getting those records, which is what we did. Isn't she here because of the word of Luis Rivera? That is not the only reason, no. Arrested the day after he gave his word that she was involved, right? That's correct. All right, so the word of a co-worker of Miss McBanwell working during that time, other than Miss Mascaro, that wouldn't be important? She says she made $100. If she made, said she made $10,000, it's not really... Because it's better to show a bank account with cash deposits that you can't attribute to a nightclub, right? I can't actually establish how much she made by talking to some other employee there. They don't have records of what she made. But you can, but you can further educate this jury on the fact that there were cash income for years from cash paying jobs, right? How can I establish that through one of the witnesses? It wouldn't, it doesn't evaluate to come out to be an actual direct evidence. That would is, be their opinion. Is that written on a plaque in Quantico? can't figure it out, we won't look at it. Objection. That's argumentative. Ask another Withdrawn. question. Agent, wasn't it, wasn't it a matter that, that you did just this very superficial investigation so that you could sit before a jury and say, hey, I did something so I couldn't cross-examine you on not doing anything? Objection. Still argumentative, Your Honor. You, you can answer the question. No, that is not true. The, we have a thousand different avenues you can take. There's thousands of rabbit holes out there and you have to take your best options to take, go down these rabbit holes without wasting all of your time and to actually go after something that could be fruitful. If we value, if we deem that it might not be fruitful by talking to some 
random waitress that might or might not know how much she made, that doesn't evaluate um, any true evidence. If there's some truly um, inculpable evidence out there or exculpable evidence out there, then we go after that and we go through that uh, thoroughly. So you choose what to investigate and whatnot? We follow the evidence is what we do. Your Honor, I got a few more on this topic and then... Okay. All right. Staying on the topic of, of cash deposits, in 2016, you interviewed Fabian Radoslovich. For the court reporter, that's R-A-D-O-S-L-O-V-I-C-H. You spoke to that guy, right? Yes, we did. And he operates Optimar International Realty, right? No, I believe he was just a just a licensed realtor within that office that actually was like a contractor in that office. All right, we're on the topic of explaining cash deposits. You learned from Mr. Radoslovich that Ms. McBanwell was paid in cash, right? $10 an hour, yes. All right. And you don't know the amount of hours that she worked, did you? She began working there on April 18th, like the day before the bump. The government didn't ask you about that, though, did they? No, I don't believe so. About her employment, her, her cash paying employment at Optimar Realty. No, I don't believe so. Sigfredo Garcia. This is going to be our last topic, but, but before the court wanted to take a break. Uh, you know him to be a drug dealer, right? Um, that's, that's the information we had, yes. You know him to also be the robber of other drug dealers along with Mr. Rivera. I know Mr. Rivera was. I don't think I have any evidence that Mr. Garcia did that. All right. He didn't tell you in the 10 4 statement. Um, that, that they would do drug rips and there was a time that they did a drug rip together? Uh, he possibly did tell us that about one time, yes. Mr. Garcia, he is a hired hitman, correct? He is, yes. And his support to Katie through that, that income, uh, drug dealing, robbing, and murdering, that would be cash, right? Um, Most times? One would suppose that he would have to pay her cash. There was no other forms of payment to her that we found. All right. Now, He's a bad guy, he's a drug user, he's a drinker, right? Yes. But there's no question, he knows how to make money. I don't know about that. How much cash did he have on him when you arrested him? Didn't have any cash on him. There was, I believe, $4,000 in the vehicle, hidden in the vehicle. Sure it wasn't five? Maybe it was five, yeah. All right. That's not a small amount of money, right? No. That's not $10 an hour type money, is that? Nope. All right. So the question again is, this is a guy that knows how to get his hands on money. I don't know that. All right. And, but what you do know, um, or, or, or what you can't say, is that he didn't support the mother of his two young kids. And they were young kids, right? They were, yes. All right. And you can't say that he wasn't supporting the mother of his two young kids, right? We had no evidence to show he was supporting them. And I know some of the calls, um, I can't say uh, how there was any payments being made. I don't know. It doesn't mean it didn't happen, though, right? It's possible. And, and, and just so I'm clear, that the spike in the deposits into Ms. McBanwell's account, right? Right. That would be consistent with the spike in Sigfredo Garcia's income by way of the murder, right? It could be. Right. Your Honor, this would be a good time, then we're going to go into the other circumstances. All right. Okay, we're going to take our afternoon break now, and uh, so the deputy will take you back. We'll take about 10 or 15 minutes, okay? All right, jury's out of the courtroom. The door is closed. Please be seated. Mr. Dukosi, can you give me a good estimate at this point? I was about to give you a page number. Out of one pages. I would say right now, I'm saying 415. So another hour, you're saying? I think so, yeah. All right. Okay. And, uh, and then we'll have redirect, and then uh, uh, we'll see what happens uh, after that. So let's go into recess um, for about 10 minutes. Okay. And then uh, we'll be back to continue. To let Your Honor know, we've got a uh, short witness, Investigator Sherry Bennett, in the event that we start our case today, the Toronto witness. I, I, I can tell you, I think that, it, and it may be a good time to tell you, our expert witness, John Sawicki, is not available tomorrow. Wait, I got an email that may be. We can 
he let me know that he may be able to come tomorrow. So forget everything yeah. I just said. He All right. Stop. So well, let's well, let's talk about your witnesses then, real quickly. Do you, do you are you going to have a list for me? The number. Of, are you going to be able to finish your witnesses potentially tomorrow? No. You're certain of that. Um, I think that we're going to be able to handle it, and then so tonight we're going to put together our final witness list. Now that we know the government, assuming the government's resting, so we know the full landscape of the case. We have all of our witnesses lined up. The plan is to have them here tomorrow. We can knock all of them out, but it's a question of Ms. McBanua, and I'll let Ms. Kowas in the courts. Okay all right, and I don't need to know that now. But what I would like to do, though, is that if we could, in any, I know that we have to break at a certain time tomorrow. Uh, for other reasons, and but uh, I want to do everything that we could potentially do to try to get all your witnesses done tomorrow, okay, and not go over into Friday, and then that way Friday morning we can start with jury instructions and closings. If they can, if the jury can get the case by noon or soon thereafter, then I'll allow them to deliberate on Friday. Uh, for a period of time. So just so that you know that that is our goal moving forward. Okay. All right. We'll be in recess.